Good morning, everybody. Great to see everybody today. Come on, why don't you look at your neighbor and tell them, look like you you lost a little weight. Just tell them that. That's always a good way to start. Something good just happened, right? That's good. And then we have altar at the end of every service where you can repent if you told a lie, but um, it always works out. Why don't you go ahead and open your Bibles to Romans 12. Romans 12, um, I want to talk about the cause within you and uh, continue this series that we've been on for a couple weeks. Uh, This is week number three, um, because I feel like in this time that we live in, it's never been more important than to figure out uh, God's will for your life, his plan for your life, and, um, and that, we, that we carry that out, that we walk through that, right? And uh, God, whatever you want to do, we want to we see you do. So I've so enjoyed the worship this morning and everything that's been done already, and so I just feel uh, led to kind of equip the church and to, so that we can go out Monday through Saturday and do everything that God's called us to do. Uh, so Romans 12, but um, while you're turning there, I want us to pray a special prayer for the Cooper family. Um, I, I don't know the latest on this, but um, some members of our church, David and Daphne Cooper, uh, their daughter-in-law, Caitlin, uh, had, a, had a baby uh, in October, and, um, and Caitlin, the mom's uh, blood pressure shot up, uh, resulted in a brain bleed, and um, in Nashville did surgery yesterday and uh, talked to the family afterwards, and they basically said, doctors have done all they can do, basically she needs a miracle. Uh, does not look good, but I mean, we serve a God who does the impossible. So, so this, is a, um, this is a but God moment. Um, somebody, I heard somebody say, but God. This is one of those but God moments. And so can we just all uh, lift up the Cooper family right now? Father God, we just come to you. Uh, for Caitlin, and Lord, we're just asking you to do what only you can do. The doctors have done what they can do, but God, you are a miracle-working God, and so Lord, we know that nothing's too hard for you. Nothing's too far gone, and so Jesus, we just speak the name of Jesus over this situation, and Jesus, we ask you to move. Holy Spirit, we ask you to go right where she is and bring healing to her body, God. Lord, bring healing to this situation. Lord, restore, recover. Lord, we just ask that you move on behalf of this mom, on behalf of this family. God, do what only you can do, and Lord, we promise to give you all the praise, all the glory. We'll tell everybody about what only you did, and Lord, we ask you to do this in the mighty, infinite name of Jesus. Lord, we ask it. Everybody said? Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Um, again, for the last couple of weeks, we've been studying this idea uh, of the cause within you, that, that God created every single one of us uniquely and wonderfully and um, gave us gifts and um, talents and personalities, and we're all different, um, but we, he, he wants us to discover what that is, and, and we've learned that the cause within us, the cause within you involves using your gifts, your talents, your experiences, your, your passion, um, as well as your pain. Come on, have me know God doesn't waste anything. He'll, he'll use your pain, um, and he, he'll do all those things. He'll use those gifts to serve others and ultimately accomplish his plan and bring him glory. I mean, that's, that's the big picture of what we want to see God do in our lives, figure out why he's wired us the way he has, why he's given us these dreams, these passions, and ultimately it's to, it's to change the world and bring glory to God. That's what he wants to do. So in Romans 12, uh, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, I uh, love this chapter, I love the book of Romans, I love chapter 12, because it's really, really practical. If you know me, you know I'm, I'm just really, really practical. Just let's let's keep it simple. Let's keep, what does that really mean? Um, Let's let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf so we can all eat them. And uh, what does this mean? And I love Romans 12 because it's really, really practical. And so let's read here. Romans 12 verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, 
then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. How many know God has a, a will, a plan for your life, and it's good, it's, it's pleasing, it's, it's perfect, it's, you know, it's so much better than our, than our plan. Verse 3, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. He says, not only do we need each other, but we belong to each other. Well, think about that. I, I, we belong to each other. Um, this is a church that if you, if you found a church home, I want you to know you belong. There's, every member belongs. Every, you belong here, and, and we need you, and we need you to discover the cause within you. And um, we belong to each other. When one hurts, we all hurt, right? When one rejoices, we all rejoice. And, um, and that's what he's calling us to do. And what we learn is that we all have grace gifts that God gives us to serve each other. We all have grace gifts. In fact, look at what he says next, verse 6. This is what we want to look at this morning to start out, and then we're kind of going to go backwards and work our way back. But he says, we have different gifts according to the grace given to, everybody say it together, each of us. In other words, every one of you have a grace gift. And then he lists, he lists seven. Now, this, this isn't an exhaustive list. It's just, he just lists a few. And he says, if your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. And so he, he tells us, look, the church is made up of all kinds of people with all kinds of gifts that God has given us, and he actually calls them grace gifts. In other words, it's, it's not just a gift, it's a grace gift. In other words, it's something from God. And, and the, the book of Romans, probably more than any other book, talks about the grace of God. It establishes that our salvation is, is by grace, right? That, that we couldn't do it by works, it's not by what we can do, but it, it's God's unmerited favor, and he tells us how God gives grace to us, right, through Jesus, through the cross, that was God's grace to us, salvation was God's grace to us, um, but in Romans 12, he talks about grace through us, that, that God wants to use his grace, to give us his grace, to operate in gifts, so his grace will operate through us to minister to others. So we've been, we've been partakers of his grace. Now he wants to use us as distributors of his grace. And he says again in verse 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Again, grace is unmerited favor. It's, it's you didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. It was, it was all God. How many know your salvation was all Jesus? It was all you did was believe. All you did was say yes to the gift. He hands you a gift and says, I'm offering you life. I'm offering you salvation. I'm, I'm offering you to a chance to be part of my family. And all you did was say yes to the invitation. Come on, that's grace. And what he teaches us, it's the same way with gifts, that there are certain gifts that you didn't ask for. Um, he just gave you. And, and because we didn't ask for them and we didn't really work for them, those are things that, um, you know, sometimes we wish we had somebody else's gift. You ever look at somebody else's gift and say, I wish I had that gift? Well, God chose to give you a different gift, All right? Uh, well, I wish I could sing like Quinn or sing like James or sing like Ray, but I can't. And that's why they don't have me up here on the worship team. And I, I've come to be okay with that, but he's given us different gifts, Right? Um, it's unmerited, unmerited favor. And, and grace is really the gift of God's enabling power at work on the inside of us. It's God doing something on the inside of us that we can't even do on our own. So my question this morning, you might write this down, what's God graced you to do? Write that down. What's God graced me to do? Be praying about that. Think about that. 
What is, what is that area, what's that thing that he's gifted you to do that no one else can do? He, he graces different people for different things at different times. Um, and, and I just want to just insert this today because I know there's a lot of people at different stages in life. There's a lot of young moms and dads in here and with babies. And, and I just want you, and teenagers and kids, and listen, I want you to know this. You are graced for the place that you're in right now. Whatever season you're in right now, God knew that season was coming, and he knew that you were heading into that, and I want you to know there's grace for that place. There's grace for that season. If you're a, if you're a young mom and, and you're just stressed out, I want you to know there's grace for that. Um, Becky and I had the privilege of watching Diana yesterday, our, our grandbaby, just for, for a few hours, and I was reminded of how much grace you need, just, just, it's, it's because she's awesome, but they're high maintenance, you know, when they're, when they're just a few months old, it, it's like, and, and Becky, it was like, Becky just, you know, she, we had three kids, and Becky just automatically just goes, jumps right back in, she's got Diana in one hand, and she's doing laundry with the other, and she's, she's changing the sheets, and, and then, and she's like, hey, can you hold her, and, and when I, when I've got Diana, it's like, that's all I got, it's like, <laughs> I'm just like, I didn't get anything done, but we had a great time. And it's just like, I don't have that grace. But, but whatever, um, whatever season you're in, listen, if you're a teenager and you're in high school, listen, uh, I know it's stressful and I know, but I'd encourage you to, to say, God, you promised me grace for this season. You said your grace was sufficient. And Lord, I'm counting on that grace to get me through school or whatever you are. Just, just lay hold of that promise that there's grace for your place. But here in Romans 12, Paul lists uh, seven grace gifts. He talks about prophesying and serving and teaching. He mentions encouraging and giving, leading, mercy, and, and they're all important. And God says, look, if I've given you that grace, use it. I didn't give it for you to bury it or to waste it. I've given it for you to use it for my glory. And I, I thought about these gifts and I thought instead, I've, teach, I've taught on these things ex- extensively, but I thought it'd be kind of neat just to see them in operation. So I just imagined this story. I thought, imagine that after church, this isn't happening, but I imagine that we w- had planned a big dinner for everybody here, all right? And we were all going to go to the Life Center, and we were going to have a dinner after church, okay? And so we've been planning this. We, imagine we've been planning this for a long time, all right? And so we, we've done all this work to get everything ready. We got the food. We've been pre- preparing for weeks. And, um, and then imagine that um, at 8 o'clock, which is normally when I get here in the mornings, at 8 o'clock on Sunday morning, uh, someone with a prophetic gift comes to me, and they say, say Pastor, I, um, God woke me up early this morning, because this is usually how it works. God woke me up early this morning, and I saw a, I don't know, I, I saw a lot of smoke. I saw a lot of people in panic. I, I just, and I just felt like I needed to tell you that. And, of course, in my mind, I'm thinking 9-11, right? I'm thinking, wow, Israel, I wonder if that's Israel. I wonder if that's 9-11. I wonder if, it, you know, the U.S. And so I, I'm, I'm thinking about that. But the Bible says we prophesy in part. And usually if somebody's got a prophetic gift, they don't give you the whole thing. It's just like, I saw, I saw smoke, I saw panic, and, and so I'm like, okay, I'll, I don't know what to do with that, but I'll be ready when it happens, right? And so, so then we go through church, and, and, and no bombs, no nothing, and then, and then we say, all right, everybody, it's time to go next door, let's go eat. And as we're walking over to the Life Center, uh, one, of the, one of the hospitality workers from the hospitality team comes out and says, oh, no, we've burnt the food. We've burnt the food. And we walk in the Life Center, and it's full of smoke. And the hospitality team is running around in a panic because all of our food has been burnt. And the prophetic person is, is like, I told you. I told you this was... <laughs> my work here is done. I will be going to McDonald's. I will see you later. Um, and so that's kind of how the prophetic gifts work. It's kind of they see things that others don't see. But then how many know the body of Christ will start jumping into action? And all of a sudden, uh, as we walk in, the person who is responsible for the food, the main one, is, is crying because they know that there's five, 600 people that we, we just lost their food. And she's crying because, we, oh, my, I can't believe I did that. And, and, and the person with the mercy gift who do you know, who, who are they going to? They're going to her. 
And they're going to pull her aside and say, don't worry, it's going to be all right. It could happen to anybody. I remember when I burnt the food. And, and they don't even care about anything else. All they care about is that person. And that mercy gift is going to go right to that person. And then you're going to have the people with the leadership gift. And that leader gift is going to be, you can call it administration or leadership. They're immediately looking around and they're thinking, somebody needs to do something. And who's in charge here? And if nobody steps up, how many know they're ready to step up? If you're not going to do it, I'll do it. And, and they're going to start saying, all right, you go, to, you go to Food Giant. All right, I need you to go to Walmart. Uh, 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 where, where's Jared and Allison? Hey, has the joint, y'all got any food? We, we need that food. Uh, somebody go to Little Caesars, buy every pizza they can get. And you're, you're already solving the problem of how we're going to feed all these people. And then there's people with serving gifts. They're just ser- they, they love to serve. And, and, and they're saying, where do you need me to go? What do you need me to do? Just don't, just don't ask me to be in charge. I'll do anything you want me to do. You want me to go to Walmart? You want me to go to Food Giant? You want me to start cooking? What do you want? Just tell me what to do. And, th- and then there's those who, you know, have that gift of encouragement. And the encourager is going to be like, hey, everybody, everybody, it's all right. Don't worry. Don't worry. It's going to be, hey, why don't we play a game? Let's have a good time. Let's get to know each other. This is, it's all going to work out. And they're just going, by the time they get done, we're all going to be happy that the food got burnt. I mean, they just got this gift. I watched Pastor Chris Hodges do that a month or so ago. We were in Alabama for a big, big conference, thousands of people. We get there, uh, Birmingham, and had a big storm. And they've got this conference they planned for a year in the first night. They have no power. They're operating on generator. And I'm like, I wonder how he's going to handle this. And he comes out like Tigger. Y'all know Tigger? Like bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. You know, I was, this is what Tiggers do best. And he comes out and he's like, hey, everybody. I know y'all have traveled a long way. I'm sure you're tired. How'd you like to go to bed early tonight? Doesn't that sound great? I tell you what, why don't y'all go home and go to bed early? And tomorrow you won't miss a thing. We're going to do it. And everybody's like, everybody's leaving happy. I'm like, he just turned the worst possible situation. But that's a, it's a gift of encouragement. And, and then there's those with the gift of giving. And I like them because he's, he's the one or she's the one. <laughs> They're the ones that come up to me and say, hey, pastor, I know we got to buy all this extra food. You just let me know. I want to pay for that. And I'm like, you can do it, my friend. I tell you what, let's, let's go. And if, that, if it was the oven's fault, I tell you what, I'll buy the church a new oven. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. And so every church needs those with the gift of giving. And, you know, you see how all the gifts work together. And then there's the person with the teaching gift. I don't know really where they fit in in this story, but I can just only imagine they're like, you know, I've analyzed the situation, and if, if we'd have done this, this, and this, I tell you what, I can show you how this will never happen again, and, and they'll give us three steps so that we never burn the food again, and, and uh, it, it'll be helpful, but not right then. Um, but that's a really a picture of, of the church and how we all have different gifts and we all find our place. Notice there's not a gift of criticism or a gift of complaining. Some people feel like that's a, a gift from the Lord, but it's, it's not mentioned in the list. It's, um, and so I wonder, is there, those are just a few. That's not all of the gifts, but did you see yourself in any of those gifts of what God's given you? And I, I want you to understand God's wired all of us differently, and he says we need each other, and we're different. It's, it's like if you're married, it's a lot like marriage. The church is a whole lot like marriage. You probably... You know, married somebody that was very different than you. And it might drive you crazy at times, but if you'll embrace their differences and say, you know what, we're better together. We're better together. And, and Becky brings things to the relationship that I just don't naturally do or naturally think. But it's better if I'll, if I'll embrace it instead of resisting it, it's, it's better. And I bring things that are better. It's just, if, if you'll just embrace it, it'll be... <laughs> No, she's done really good, I promise you. It's, uh, it's been a whole lot harder for her than it has for me, I'm sure. But, um, but I want to give you three more keys as we've been studying for the last couple weeks on the cause within you. Let me give you three more things that we learned from this text. Um, and the, the first one is this. If you want to see God use your life, it starts with humility. All right, it, it really starts here. Look at Romans 12, 3. 
uh, just back up a couple verses there from where we were. He says, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. And he says, look, don't, don't think too highly of yourself. Um, if, if you have a gift, whatever that gift is, and maybe your gift is a visible gift. Maybe, you know, your gift is, is, is like my gift, a speaking gift or a teaching gift or something where it's more visible um, or vocal. He said, Re- remember, don't, don't think too big of yourself. Remember, it was a gift. And, um, and it was a gift that was given to you to serve others. If you'll, if you'll remember this, that I think I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but Jesus is handing out towels, not titles. He, he's, he, he's like, you want to be great? You want to be great? Um, here's a towel. Start serving. Start. And, and that was the picture of that is when Jesus, uh, uh, I think it was James and John who were arguing. They were brothers. And this is, Jesus has been with them for like three and a half years. He's, he's about to go to the cross and after all that time he spent with them, they were with him all the time. And James and John were arguing about who's going to be the greatest. Hey, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom and you sit on that throne, um, James, my, my brother, he thinks he should sit on the left. And I feel like I should sit on the right. And I, I kind of like to see it the other way around. Uh, what do you think, Jesus? And, and Jesus was, was like, well, I got something to say about that, but let me... Let me show you what it is to, to lead. And then shortly after that, he takes them to a room, and, and they're all having dinner, and, and Jesus takes off his outer garment, puts on a towel, brings out a, a basin of water, and he gets down on his knee, and he starts washing their feet. And, he's, and he gives them this lesson. He says, y'all want to be great? You want to be great? He said, the greatest among you will be the one who serves everybody else. And that's, that's the reminder here of whatever gift God has given you, it was meant to serve others. It was meant to minister. If someone has a singing gift, praise God for that. I'm thankful, I'm thankful that we have people on the platform who can sing. That, it makes it easier, doesn't it? But that gift was given to, not to perform, but to, to usher the rest of us into the presence of God, to serve, a, to serve the church in worship and saying, come on, everybody, let's worship God together. Not, not so they're lifted up, but so he's lifted up, right? And, and it's that gift is given to, to serve others. And he, he, says, he says, if you want to be great, serve. And he, he, he demonstrates that by washing their feet and then the greatest demonstration of all, he goes to the cross. He says, the greatest among you is the one who will give his life for other people. And so he goes to the cross and dies in her place. And then he comes and he meets with them in his resurrected body. And he, he, they, they all get filled with the spirit, the same spirit that's on the inside of, of him. And he says, listen, here's the purpose for the Holy Spirit. So you can go and you can serve with the same love and the same power and the same passion that I have. I'm going to give you my spirit, not, not for yourselves only, but to fulfill the call of God. And, and when, they, when all that happened, between the foot washing and the cross and being filled with the Holy Spirit, can I tell you something? They were transformed. James and John were no longer talking about who's going to be the greatest. It was Their, their hearts were changed, and, and now all of a sudden they have this attitude of we're here to serve and it's not about us. I think about in Acts chapter 3, um, you, you can read it later, but Peter and John go up to the temple at the time of prayer, and when they're going there, there's a lame man, and, and um, God gave them the gift of healing. I'm going to move it. That's been bothering me ever since we were in worship. So um, anyway, I think that's from Wednesday night, but um, it, it's, it, it, Peter and John were uh, going up to the temple. They see this lame man, and, and they ask God for a gift of healing. God gives it. And they said, Peter and gold, uh, uh, Peter and gold, silver and gold we don't have, but what we have in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And God gave that man a gift of healing. And, and Peter and John didn't have, like, that, they couldn't do that all the time. Um, but in that moment, God gave it to them. 
He had faith to be healed. They had faith to give the gift. The guy give, gets up, and then all of a sudden, the crowd kind of goes crazy, and they're like, they're trying to make a big deal about Peter and John. Like, like let's worship Peter and John. And Peter and John just shut it down, and they say, don't look at us as if by our godliness or our power that this man walked. They said, it was only the name of Jesus. Don't don't look at us, look at Jesus. In other words, they got it. They finally realized that the purpose of the gift, the purpose of what God does in our life is, is to minister to other people and that Jesus gets all the glory. And God says, if you can do that, if you can stay humble, there's no There's no limit to what I can do with your life. And so he says, whatever gift you've got, remember it came by grace. Listen, if you're you're naturally merciful, and you just got the gift of mercy, then I would encourage you, don't look down on others who don't naturally have that gift. Well, why can't you just be more like me? Well, why can't you be more humble? I'm just saying, um, don't look down on others who have that gift. If you're a born leader, can I tell you something? That was a gift. That was a gift from God. And some of you knew you were a leader in kindergarten. I mean, you're bossing, I mean, you're leading people and and you're you're forming groups. (laughs) Um, Others of you, God calls you to leadership positions, but you're a reluctant leader, but God will give you grace for that too. He gave you that gift to serve others. And I love it what he says. Let's read that verse again. He said, um, It says, don't think more highly of yourselves, but think of yourself with sober judgment. In other words, what he's saying is have an accurate view of yourself. I found a lot of people, especially in our church, that it's not that they have too high a view for themselves, they have too low a view of themselves. They don't see themselves the way God sees them. They see their mistakes, they see their faults, they see their failures, and, and it's just as important that we don't have too high a view of ourselves, that we, do, we don't have so low of a view of ourselves that we're always putting ourselves down. And, and um, you need to have an accurate view. Let's see ourselves through the lens of what God's word says. Come on, you're a, you're a child of God. And when you got saved, now you are his child and his blood now flows through your veins, which means you are royalty. You are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. You are wonderfully made. You are chosen. You are loved. And listen, we need to see ourselves the way that God sees us. And we also need an accurate view of how we see God, right? He's not just the, the big guy upstairs. He's not just my buddy. He is almighty God. He is holy. He is Yes, he's my father, but he's also the creator, and he's awesome and holy, and, and I need to have an accurate view of God. And the, the attitude of humility says, God, I'm the servant, you're the master. God, you tell me what to do, I'll do it. Here, here's my hands, here's my feet, I'll do what you want me to do, I'll go where you want me to go. And we used to sing a song a lot growing up, is all to Jesus I surrender, all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender all. Come on, it's a consecration song. Lord, here's my life. You purchased it. You bought it. I give you everything. But listen, in order to think like that, we have to have our mind renewed. We have to have our thinking transformed. And so so here's the second thing. Write this down. Um, God has a good pleasing, or you can take a picture. This is kind of long. God has a good, pleasing, and perfect plan for our lives, but we only discover it when we reject the world's plan and let God shape our thinking and direct our steps. And I wanted to make that really short, but I just, it just kept going. God has a good, pleasing, and perfect plan for our lives, but we only discover it when we reject the world's plan and let God shape our thinking and direct our steps. Look how it says it in Romans 12. He says it this way, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, God has a will for you. He has a plan, and he wants you to discover it 
But in order to discover it, some of y'all are like, like, God, show me your plan. And he's like, I want to show you my plan, but it starts when we don't conform to the pattern of this world. It's not going to, be, it's not going to come through worldly thinking. It's going to come as our minds are renewed and transformed. And listen, when it, it, it takes a process. How many know when, when you got saved, God made you right? You were right before God. He took all your sin away. And when you stand before God, you're holy and just and righteous before him. How many know that's true? But how many know when you got saved, he didn't make you bright? You still got the same brain you had before. You still think the same way. And so he says, in order for God's plan and God's will to be revealed to us, we have to have our mind transformed. And the reality is, if, if, if you were in the world a long time or you... You know, just living in the world, we've got a whole lot of stuff up there that has to be relearned and rethought and, and dealt with. And when you get saved, spiritually, you're a baby, and we got to grow up. And we grow up by, it's, it's a combination of the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And, and listen, we have to be, this is to everybody, we have to be intentional about daily renewing our minds um, because there's a current in this world that will, you'll get swept up in if you're not intentional about it. Um, I, I told this years ago, but um, I grew up in the country, and uh, we, didn't, we didn't swim in swimming pools. We swam in ponds, right? Ponds and lakes. And, and I remember as a kid, um, one, I grew up in Henderson, Kentucky, and one Saturday, my dad had bought a boat. It wasn't a new boat. It was a used boat, which meant we worked on it more than we played on it, but, um, or he worked on it. And so we took this boat to the Ohio River and never been in a river before. I swam in ponds and lakes. And we're at the, at the Thunder Over to the Ohio or whatever it is, and time trials, boat races and stuff. And I'm there, I'm a kid, and I'm hot, and I'm sweating. I'm like, Dad, please let me get in the water. Please let me get in the water. And... and uh, and he's like, fine, get in the water. I jumped in that river, and we were anchored. We, we were anchored. The boats were still, because there were boats all around us. And the minute I jumped in that water, listen, I was just, it just swept me away. And thankfully, there was people, about three boats back, you know, somebody just reaches down and picks me up, and they're like, we got your kid, you know. And, it's, and But what I realized is that that there was a current there. And that's the way this world is. And listen, unless you're anchored to Jesus, unless you're anchored to the word of God, and unless you're intentional about staying anchored that, that, that my thinking is going to be based on what the Bible says, I'm, I'm going to be based on, I'm going to be led by the Spirit. If not, the minute you get up, you're stepping into a river. The minute you turn on your TV, the minute you turn on your phone, the minute you go to school, the minute you go to work, listen, there is a current that will sweep you up in it. And it's not like you're trying to go that direction, everybody. It's just going to, it's going to carry you away. But if we get up every day and say, no, I'm going to start my day in the Word. I'm going to start my day in prayer. I'm going to, throughout the day, I'm going to meditate on the Word of God and, and allow Him to transform my thinking. Notice what he says again, Romans 12, 2, do not conform. Come on, have you know we're, we're supposed to be nonconformists? Everybody wants you to conform. Y'all just conform. Y'all just be like everybody else. You're not supposed to be like everybody else. We're not supposed to conform, we're supposed to be transformed. You know, that word transformed is, it's like metamorpho in the Greek. It's where we get our word metamorphosis. You know, think about caterpillar to butterfly. That's transformation. But what, what hit me is this week, I realized that that word, as I was studying this, is the same word that's used when, in Matthew, I think it's 17, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, same word. And it says he was there with, with uh, I think it was Peter, James, and John. And, um, and while he was on that mountain, he takes them up to a high mountain by themselves. And the Bible says he was transfigured before them. And his, his face began to shine like the sun. His clothes began to shine like bright white light. And, and, and don't think it was like a spotlight from heaven on Jesus. That wasn't it. What it was, was the, what was on the inside of him came out. 
See, when Jesus was always God, he was always God wrapped in flesh, but he, in his humility, he wrapped himself in flesh, and so they didn't recognize his glory. They didn't know who he was, but in a moment of time, he says, hey, you guys, you don't want to miss this. They were about to fall asleep. He said, just like some of y'all now. He said, you don't want to miss this. <laughs> and, 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 and some of y'all just woke up and said, what do he say? Why is everybody laughing? So, in, in a moment of time, what was on the inside began to shine on the outside. And they were like, "Woo! who is this? We just saw God. He's more than a carpenter. He's more than whoever this Jesus. Who is this? Listen, that's what it means when the Bible says you got to be transformed. Here's what God wants to do with you. He wants to get what's on the inside on the outside. Come on. How many know he's... He's, if you've saved, how many know, everybody say, I got Jesus in my heart. Well, praise God. Let him out of there and let him get to your hands and get to your feet. Come on, he wants to get to your mouth. <laughs> I got the Holy Spirit on the inside, but he's, he's saying, come on, let's, let's be transfigured. Let's let what's on the inside begin to affect what's on the outside. And, and that's the picture. And he says, well, how does that happen? Well, real, real transformation happens as we begin to allow the Word of God and the Spirit of God change our lives. It's, it's a combination of both. See, God has given us His Word to instruct us on how to live, but He's given His Spirit to empower us and to guide us through life. Look at this promise real quick, Galatians 5, 16. It says this, um, so I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Well, that's a big promise. He said, I've given you my Spirit so you don't have to live the way you used to live. And, and then look at this encouragement, this exhortation, Galatians 5, 24, 25. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh. In other words, don't be conformed to the world with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let the Spirit guide your life. Look at Psalm 1 real quick. Y'all got to listen fast. We're running out of time here. Psalm, Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful or the mockers, he says, blessed is that man. Notice he starts. Remember what Paul said, don't be conformed to the world. Well, the psalmist is giving you, telling you, here's how not to be conformed. Another translation says, don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. How do I not do, how do I keep the world from squeezing me into its mold? He says, well, it, it starts right here. Who are you walking with? Who are you getting your counsel from? If your marriage is in trouble and are, are you talking to your non-Christian friends, well, I'd divorce him if I were you. i tell you what I'd do right now. You ought to leave him. God's got a better one for you. They wouldn't say that. But it, it's, it's just, who, who are you getting your counsel from? Walk not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the path of sinners. Who are you running with? Who are you hanging out with? Nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Or mockers. What are you watching? What, what do we listen to? And that's how the world shapes our thinking and shapes our thoughts. And I, I was talking to, uh, yesterday I had a call from a young man that grew up in our church. He was um, one of the youth in our church and grew, grew up in the church. And uh, after high school, he, he kind of thought, I'm going to go out and do my own thing. And he did that. And uh, he just got out of five years in prison. And he called me yesterday. One of the first people he called, he, he messaged me on Messenger. And he's like, hey, Brother Troy, can I call you? And I gave him, of course, I gave him my phone number. And uh, he called me yesterday. And uh, he's like, Troy, this is Bradley. And uh, he's like, man, I'm, I'm like, where you been, Bradley? And I didn't know. And he told me. I, oh, man, I hate to hear that. And he, he said, but I, I've been sober for six years. Uh, prison helps with that. <laughs> and, uh, and he said, um, he said, I'm ready to get on the right track. I'm ready. 
I'm ready. And, uh, and so I'm like, Bradley, you got to you know, watch who you hang out with. Get you a good job. I was, yesterday was Saturday. I said, where are you going to church tomorrow? Come on, because because his, the, the thing that got him off track is who he got counsel from, who he was standing with, who he was sitting with. And, I, and I'm like, no, you know, Bradley, this is your chance for a fresh start. Can't wait to follow up with him today, see how it went. But, but look at this. Look at verse 2. It says, but, but the one who's blessed... His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates. Come on, everybody say it. Day and night. It's not just a morning devo. It's day and night. I'm thinking about the Lord. It's, he's on my mind. And he says, that one will be like a tree who's planted by the rivers of living water. It'll bring forth its fruit in season. His leaf will never prosper. Whatever he does will prosper. In other words, it doesn't matter what's going on in the world. It doesn't matter if you're plugged into the Lord, if you're plugged into his word, if you're being led by his spirit, it doesn't matter what goes on in the world around us. He, he's saying that the one, Becky, you can come, worship team, you guys can come on up. His delight is in the law of the Lord. In his law, he meditates. In other words, what he's saying is this, God's word the one who's being transformed, the one who is discovered the cause within them is the one who is allowing God's word to govern their thinking, govern their decisions. Every decision passes through the filter of God's word. It's not just what I feel, it's what does God's word say. Let me, let me make one comment about the um, upcoming election, all right? Just, just one, let me, give, let me give you real quick. No, number one, don't put your faith or hope in a political candidate. This is just a couple weeks away. This will just maybe help somebody. Don't put your faith or hope in a political candidate. They're not the Messiah. Jesus is our Messiah. Amen. All right? Number two, if you have the right to vote, you should, and you should steward that vote well. People died so you could vote. All right? So, so steward it well. Here, here's the third thing. Don't vote for a personality right? And we got some personalities out there. Don't vote for a personality. Vote on policy. Personalities come and go. A few years, they'll be gone, but policy sticks around a long time. And so we'll say, well, what do I do? Here's what I do. I, I, I find out where each candidate stands on issues, and then I run them through the filter. Who, who is most pro-Israel? Who's most pro-life? Neither one of them are perfect. Which one's the closest? Which, which one uh, lines up with biblical values the closest. And then it's really, it takes the emotion out of it. And it just says, okay, I'm just gonna do my best to filter it through that. And then whoever wins, wins, and I'm gonna pray for them either way. And in the process, I'm gonna be nice to people. Because we're called to love, right? All right, that's enough about that, all right. Um, here, here's the last thing. We only experience the cause within us when we yield our bodies to the Lord. Look how it started, Romans 1, or 12, verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies up as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Another translation says, this is your reasonable service. Notice that verse starts with therefore. Therefore. You say, what is that therefore? It, it, what he's saying is, in view of everything I've told you in the book of Romans, that all have sinned and fallen Sorry. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That there's no one righteous, no, not one. But let me tell you what. But God demonstrated his love for you. And that while you were still a sinner, Christ died for you. And, and if you will believe in your heart and confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, then God will save you and wipe away all your sin. And what he says is, therefore, in view of all of God's mercy, and in view of everything that he did for you, he says, here's what God wants from you. Give him your life. Give him your body. 
He says, give your body as a living sacrifice. He doesn't need any more dead sacrifices. Come on, Jesus was the end of that. He was the last sacrifice that ever had to die. For once and for all, he shed his blood for everyone. And he says, I don't need any more dead sacrifices. What I want is some living sacrifices. Some people say, Lord, here's my body. Do with me what you want. Whatever gift you want to give, whatever place you want me to go, like God, my life is yours. And I'll surrender everything to you. Come on, when we look at what Jesus did, don't you think it's only reasonable? Isn't it only reasonable? That's our reasonable. Isn't it only reasonable that we would say, Lord, here's my life? You paid my sin debt. You went to the cross for me. Come on, stand to your feet. Listen, if you're here today and you're away from the Lord, I want you to know he loves you. When the Bible says in Romans 5, when you were a sinner, Christ died for you. That was the demonstration of his love. I was talking with someone this week, another young man who grew up in the church, and they got away from the Lord, and they were like, I hadn't seen God move, and I I said, "Let, let me tell you something. God demonstrated his love for you. That he died for you even though you don't even care about him. And Paul says in Romans 12, listen, in view of all that, oh, shouldn't we give him our life? Listen, if you're here today and you're away from the Lord, in in view of all that Jesus has done for you, can I encourage you? Just, Just receive the gift of salvation. Receive the gift of life. He paid a great price for your salvation. You're, you're, it's a gift, but it wasn't, it wasn't cheap. He paid everything. If you're saved this morning, listen, it's time to use the gifts he's given you to serve others, bring glory to God. Hallelujah. We praise you, Lord. praise you, God. Come on, just lift your hands right now. Let's sing this to the Lord. If all of you, come on, lead that, Quinn. Come on, sing it out. Let this be a prayer. pray, come pray. You need to talk to the Lord. Maybe you need a fresh start with God. This is, this is your moment. Just slip out of your seat. Maybe come and pray. But this is a prayer song. Let's just offer ourselves up to the Lord today. Amen? Well, let's pray.